Thank you. Jay Baba, everyone. So nice to be here at the place I did meet Mayor Baba. I think the last time I was here I talked about uh, the year 52 and meeting Baba and how I came to Baba. So I'll skip that and go to 56 and 58. Uh, so I'll have a few n new, new stories. Um, after meeting Bob in 52 here, uh, with Baba you never knew when you would see him again. And so we always took the ultimate opportunity to be with Baba. And in 56, uh, before 56 actually came, Baba was hinting that he would come. And uh, my roommate, Beryl Williams, maybe some of you know Beryl, uh, we kind of got the idea, well, wouldn't it be great if we tagged along with Baba? He was planning to go around the world. And Energy Florsheim had uh, very well organized uh, the trip. And we were allowed to donate toward Baba's trip with the Mondeley coming. And we had a big map at Ella Winterfell's. And each donation, we moved the little flag further around the world. And uh, so we kind of wrote to Baba, wouldn't it be nice if, if we could fly along with you? You know, we made just kind of a hint. <laughs> and then it got a little more opening crack from Baba and a little more and a little more. And actually it wound up from our starting just a, a little jab in the dark like that that Baba gave permission for anyone who wished to, of his lovers, to fly with him in 56. So then uh, we signed up and Energy got the whole plan laid out. So eventually, I think from Myrtle Beach, I don't remember how many from New York, uh, about 80 people flew from Myrtle Beach to Los Angeles and then to San Francisco. And that was, uh, of course it was all Baba's whim ahead of time, you know, but. <laughs> It was kind of nice to think that we opened it up that way. And in 56, um, it was in the summer again, of course, Bob always came in the summer. And we went to Kennedy Airport to wait for him. And he was, if you know Kennedy Airport, the customs is on a higher level, big plate glass. And we saw Bob walking up and down there. That was our first glimpse of Bob and he waved to us in his pink coat. Meanwhile, we had to wait for him to clear customs. And we were a big circle of people in the airport. And this lady comes by, and uh, she was meeting some diplomat from Israel. She said, when Baba came down, finally, he went around the whole circle and embraced each one of us. And it was, it was just a beautiful scene. And I had made a garland of red, white, and blue flowers for Baba. You know, patriotic, I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> I had fun putting it on Baba. And she came up and she said, who is this man? I've never seen such love shown toward anybody. And, you know, such a feeling of love. So we very slap happily. I mean, I did. I said, well, he's the Messiah, you know, <laughs> meeting him here at Kennedy. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, he was to be driven to the Hotel Del Monaco by uh, Harry Florsheim, who had a convertible coupe. Some of these things you see in the movies. And the hood got stuck. You know, they wanted to pull it up over Baba, and it got stuck. And so it was a long line of cabs and buses were held up, honking and make a terrible racket. While Baba sat in the car looking just beautiful, <laughs> and he couldn't get this hood up. Anyway, we followed him to the Delmonico. And then uh, to show how Baba works, these little stories, uh, uh, for a long time, Baba stood in the lobby, a whole hour in the lobby of the Delmonico, and we were milling around there wondering why, what happened. And it turned out that Marion Florsheim, as the hostess, had the key to his room, and she'd forgotten and gone off somewhere. And Baba waited there. The avatar waited a whole hour till she remembered <laughs> that she had the key, and she was the hostess to show. Now, of course, he could have called for uh, someone to but he wanted to teach her that lesson that you don't forget things like that. So he stood in the lobby a whole hour and finally was shown to his room. And then we hung around there. And a few of us bit by bit got called in to be with Baba. And it came our turn, Adele and I, and uh, called in. And Baba looked at us and said, are you traveling with the rest of the way? And we said, yes, Baba. And he said, how did you get the money? 
and we said we worked and saved and he was very happy with that and I remember there was at the same time a man there I don't know his name now but I think energy we'd all or she'd gotten the idea of someone doing a portrait of Baba and he was one of these artists that do the scraggle scraggle lines you know not a real clear line but just millions of lines you know and he was sitting there looking at Baba he was just lost he was amazing. <laughs> he couldn't, there was no way. And nobody ever saw the picture because he just, and Baba was so full of energy. And later on, he stayed in New York for several days and saw people all the time down in the lobby there. And uh, toward the end of his stay, uh, I think Margaret Stancers offered to take him on a tour of New York uh, just to let him get out of the hotel and everything. But then the rest of us heard about that, so we got <laughs> finally wound up all of us going and they hired a sightseeing bus. <laughs> and I never forget, um, it was a bus with a driver and a spieler, you know, giving a spiel. And this poor spieler, you know, he faced us all and he, we went up Park Avenue, I think, first from Delmonico. Well, over here, Greta Garbo and over here, Mary and uh, what is that? Monroe did such and such. And nobody was paying the slightest attention to him. We were all looking at Bob. And he, he just ran out of steam. You know? <laughs> he got so disgusted. <laughs> and then we came up, and uh, Bob said he wanted to go up on the West Side Highway. And the bus driver said, No, buses are allowed up there. Bob said, I want to go up there. So the bus driver <laughs> he got up on the highway, and we went all the way down the West Side Highway in this big bus. And I think. And Bob, I watched Bob all the time, of course, and his fingers were working like this. And I've kind of guessed that he was working, you know, all the ships from all the world are lined up there on the west side. And I think he was working on some of those countries. There was, you know, how all these international ships. That was my guess. And then we came down, we went through Wall Street, and Bob had a little piece of tinfoil in his hand. And he was looking very serious, you know, and he didn't look up at all. And Bob, someone said, oh, Baba, there's Wall Street. And he said, yes, I know. And I felt that he was, because he was touching the metal. Now, these are just flashes, you know, that he was working on the money, money, you know. And then we came up uh, down 42nd Street East, and we came to Lexington Avenue. There was a red light. There was a cop with his hand. and had no left turn. And then Baba put his hand out like that, and the bus driver just went like that. I went right up. <laughs> just, totally, just so, con it was so cute, I just thought. <laughs> and so many people met Baba there in the Delmonico. I remember one woman who had been a chiropractor or whatever for a lot of us, for the Winterfells and all, Dr. Williams. And she was very skeptical. She was a psychiatrist and a chiropractor. She said, oh, these people, you know. Anyway, she came, and she was standing there like this, looking around. And there were people sobbing and crying after having met Bob. She's, you know, just really emotionally, you know, you just see. And then Baba called her. <laughs> and the next time I went through the, that room there, she was crying and crying. And she said to me, no, I know, but Baba love me, you know. <laughs> it was so cute. <laughs> it was really fun. And Baba had beckoned after, uh, beckoned me and Beryl and the uh, two, maybe one, I don't know, a couple, two, there were long lines of people to bring in to Baba to have darshan. Of course, Baba had the grapes, you've seen that in the movie. And introducing people, and introducing, and you just get like you just get drowned in Baba's love. He's pouring it out on everybody, and it was a very hot day, and I was just going like this. So Baba said, "All right, you go." After several hours, and uh, another girl took my place. And it was it was a real privilege to introduce people to Baba, and a lot of individual little scenes went on, and. Uh, I was introducing people to Baba, and Baba looked at me and went like this, and I didn't know what. He pointed, and way down at the end of the line, there was my father coming. He knew it was my father. I didn't see him. And uh, so my father came, met Baba. And uh, there were people who met him, just saw him. Uh, the elevator operator was so taken with Baba. You know, he was riding Baba up and down all the time in the elevator. And uh, he finally just broke down and said, who is this man, and they told him, and he, he was so touched by them. 
And then we got on the plane and came down here and uh, spent days with Bob. And that was one of the very wonderful times with Bob was early in the morning. It had been a very, very hot night and lots of thunder and lightning and everything. And Baba looked so drawn, you know, he's sitting there on the rails by the lake and sweating. Even at seven in the morning, it was six or seven in the morning, and he said, all the burden is on me and I, of universal suffering. I worked all night for the universe. And, and then he asked us, this was early in the morning, uh, he stood right by the lake facing us, that's facing west, and had us on the western line and he worked very quietly. And then he beckoned us and we moved this way. We went like counterclockwise, four positions, and he stood. It was very solemn. And of course, we were like you are in the center, you don't know the news and stuff, but that was a very critical time in the history was uh, the Suez Canal crisis and stuff like that. And uh, so Baba had obviously worked on that. We found out afterwards that very day. And so sometimes you felt that you were not only individually with Baba, but he called these sabhas for his, his work too, you know, his political work or work in the world. Baba would often say, while I'm here with you, I'm working all over the universe. And uh, you see that in the film last night, that quiet moment there. And uh, I remember, uh, I'll skip to 58, I shouldn't do that, but anyway. Uh, 58, the first morning in the barn with Baba, he said, all those who love me, raise their hand. So everybody raised their hand. And then he said, all those who will obey me, raise their hand. And everybody raised their hand but one man, you know. So he made him stand up and said, why didn't you raise your hand? And, uh, he said, Baba, I don't know if I can obey you. He was probably more honest than the rest of us. And he said, Baba said, try. Try. That's all you can do. Try. So then he said, uh, you've all promised to obey me now. We could spend each morning here in the barn with the discourse, and then in the afternoon I'll be in the lagoon cabin and see whomever I like. And do you mind if I may call for one over and over and over and for some none at all? And everybody said, yes, it's fine, Bob, you know. So that's what happened. And Bob kept calling over and over and over for this one lady and two very objectionable children. <laughs> and you could just see, I mean, you didn't have to be psychic and read anybody's mind. People were sitting around the cabin. <laughs> so then the next morning, <laughs> Baba really, t as the English people say, ticked us off, said, yesterday you promised to obey me and you said you wouldn't mind if I had whoever I liked as many times as I wanted. And you did mind. You did mind. You were upset. And therefore I'm leaving. <laughs> I'm going back to India. <laughs> and we said, oh no, Bobby, you know, it's a big outcry. And then he again said, well now what do you want? Shall we have discourses in the barn? <laughs> or, just dis or just interviews? And so, well of course we said, Baba, do what you want. But he did plan to leave three days earlier. He chopped his trip and went off to San Francisco and uh, by Dr. Duncan was with him, and that was the famous case where there was nothing on the plane to eat, except Dr. Duncan had this can of Spam, <laughs> and Baba ate Spam on the trip. And I've uh, been asked by vegetarians, now are you sure Baba ate that Spam? <laughs> They're real upset Baba ate Spam. <laughs> and that was, that was 58 though. <laughs> but go back to 56, um, so we, we spent some lovely days here with Baba, 56, and that was the time in the movie you saw last night where they put on the show for Baba in the barn. And uh, there was the funny show of the Alligator Club where uh, I remember one scene, they had Dana Field as the baby in the baby carriage. <laughs> and they operated on him, up for his Sanscaras, Dr. Chamberlain and Nick, the other doctors. And they pulled out this huge bunch of rubber uh, balloons that looked like intestines, you know, <laughs> they kept pulling them out. <laughs> that was Dana's sense here. It was cute. And, but then there was some lovely dancing by Margaret's dancers, and I remember one, uh, I don't know his last name, Jean, uh, dancer, did uh, the dance of evolution. 
And he did, you know, from the rock state to, the, you know, all the stages. It was a beautiful solo. And uh, his story was kind of interesting. For years, he had worked up to, uh, in his career, it's difficult in ballet, you know, to, he'd been offered this tremendous final beautiful job in Europe, and then, or just at the time of the Savas here. So he had to choose between, you know, coming with Baba or, or the job. And he chose Baba. And actually, I don't know, I think it's probably uh, accurate that he never quite got that kind of a job offer again. So that was sort of like your choice. There were many choices, like I too, so it was kind of uh, interesting. The day before Baba came, I got a special cable from my mother. She just discovered she had breast cancer and was rushed to the hospital. Well, normally you'd rush out to California and be with your mother. And I said, no, Baba's coming the next day. And then the minute Baba saw me and everything, he said, how's your mother? And I said, well, Baba, she's probably on the operating table right now. Don't worry, you know. And so my mother did survive and lived for quite a number of years after. But, you know, sometimes <laughs> funny choices. And in 56, we went on to, to Hollywood and uh, Baba gave Darsha in there, and he was written up very well in the paper there. The papers here didn't do too well. In New York, Ivy Ducet arranged a press conference, classic newspaper reporters, and they asked really kind of stupid questions. And uh, they asked about Billy Graham, I remember, and Baba said, uh, well, it's, it's good to, you know, give talks, but not if your pride gets in the way or some, you know, <laughs> obvious remark like that. I thought about that. And we had tried at that time to get so many people, famous people, to meet Baba. We still were into that, Adele and I, and, uh, you know, all these famous religious people didn't want to see Baba. But in Hollywood, they wrote him up very well in the Hollywood Citizen News, took some lovely photos of Baba, and a nice interview. And uh, there was Darshan in the hotel there, Hollywood Roosevelt, which we found out later was uh, where the very first uh, Motion Picture Academy Award was given, and a lot of historic things happened in that hotel. And again, uh, I saw some little interesting things. One girl came through the mezzanine. She said, what's going on here, you know? And I said, oh, well, uh, the, in that room there is the Messiah and people meeting him. She said, oh, do you think I could? <laughs> and I said, sure, why not? So I went up to Audie, and, and she went in, a total stranger, very nice one, and met Baba. And she came out, and she thanked me. She thanked me for it. And I thought, well, how perceptive, you know, to, to do something like that on the spur of the moment. And also, Baba met the, Dr. Evans once there, too, and asked him if he'd write an introduction to Life at Its Best. And he, you, you all know him, he translated the Tibetan Book of the Dead and all. Very nice, very nice. And he had great reverence for Baba. And so there were some interesting moments there in Hollywood. And we went up to Mayor Mount. Uh, where Agnes Barron, the watchdog of Merriman, <laughs> we spent the day there. It was, it was very interesting. Baba sat under this giant live oak tree. I was right next to Baba, and he got this very far away look in his eyes and said, I've been here before. Well, actually, in, to, in his incarnation now, he had never been there. So you just wonder, because California is very new, I mean, you can't say the Avatar. <laughs> Uh, so he must have referred to some other incarnation, we don't know. But I remember the look he gave. And uh, some little interesting stories happened there. Um, Agnes had a big dog, shepherd dog. It followed Bob all around instead of following Agnes. His name was Wolf, I think. And at the very end, Baba got in the car to go, and Wolf put his head right on Baba's lap, and Baba patted his head like that. I just was right nearby and uh, said that he would, after he dropped his body, he'd be a human being. Mm -hmm. And uh, he did pass away about a couple months later. And we always did try to bring pets to Baba, you know. I know in 52, uh, we brought animals to Baba. We got a whole jar of these tree frogs you hear every night. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Charmin brought this jar. And, 
They're all at the bottom of the jar, and then Baba had held the jar, and they all jumped to the side to, to try to get to Baba. It was really unique. And she brought a brown rabbit, and people brought birds, and dogs, cats, and so. And you've heard the story of the turtle. It's uh, the animal world responds to Baba. To you. Baba said, you know, that fantastic statement. He said, I'm not only the avatar for human beings, but I'm the avatar for each and every form of life. I'm an ant avatar to the ant, you know, stuff like that. And uh, so we went from Miramount to, to San Francisco, and that was kind of interesting. Uh, the Sufis, that was their city, and they'd worked very, very hard with energy, especially to, to make the accommodations for us all in this one hotel, Holiday Lodge. And uh, we'd all been assigned rooms, and they had naturally picked the best room for Baba, which was sort of a duplex in the back of the hotel, you know, a two, two-story thing. And Baba didn't like it at all. And while we were sitting around <laughs> in the lobby, uh, we saw Ludd and Ivy and whoever or some other Sufi come out of Baba's room crying and red and upset and everything. The word got around Baba was leaving for India. He didn't like his rooms. <laughs> and then Baba wants you, Phyllis and Adele. So we went, oh my God. So it turned out we too had the rooms that Baba liked. So it was right in the middle of all the other rooms. And Baba said, would you exchange rooms? I said, yes, Baba. So we got the new place <laughs> in the back. And it was a terrible long walk around. And uh, it was funny. The place was stuffed with food and flowers and everything. And one time when the Sufi lady, we were waiting for Baba to come into the meeting hall, and she came up to me and she said, uh, would you go get the something, something, cookies or something from the refrigerator in Baba's the old Baba room. I said, no, I wouldn't. And she was very shocked. <laughs> I said, no, you don't leave. I didn't explain to her, but actually, you see, you never leave Baba unless you're... Um, Baba would be very offended. He gave, he gave us this le uh, lesson so many times, you've heard it from other people I know, that you don't leave his presence without his permission. And no matter what you think you have to do. And uh, we all got that lesson. <laughs> There was somebody here who, uh, <clears throat> I guess Kitty had asked to help uh, make Baba's food. And that person said, yes, that's wonderful. You know, you think serving Baba, making his food. But in the barn here, after the talk, Baba sent for him. Where were you? Oh, I was helping Kitty. I told you I wanted you with me all the time. You know, and so it pounds into your head that uh, you stay with Baba. And that was, it was very hard to, for some people to get that pounded in their head. <laughs> uh, like in the Roosevelt Hotel, Baba called for us early one morning, and John Bass wasn't there, and somebody else with him, Dr. Heyman or something. And someone was always sent out to get them, you know. And that was horrible. You didn't want to leave Baba and run and get somebody else. So they ran and got John. And I remember Baba looking at him very seriously and saying, where were you? Oh, I went to take a walk. And you may not see me again in 700 years. That was Baba's favorite threat. <laughs> Why aren't you here? <laughs> 700 years. And uh, so you had to stick close to Baba. And uh, anyway, Baba li finally liked his room. And then he said, well, I'll stay if I like my lunch. So we, no, nobody <laughs> ate lunch. <laughs> and then we heard Baba liked his lunch. And everybody relaxed. <laughs> And then they went sightseeing. The, the Sufis had arranged a lot of nice sightseeing. But that Baba threw some Maya dust in that. We got lost following Baba. And Lud got lost driving Baba. And, oh, we were running around in the Presidio and up and down. I mean, it was kind of strange. It's like running around in Maya. <laughs> and, and we uh, also went up to Quake Tower, which is the highest place, this beautiful tower. And we all got out. And then I heard the clap. Phyllis, Baba wants you. So I went over there, and Baba, when I stood beside him, he went like that. And he pointed down the bay south. And I, you don't ask Baba what he means, right? And so I had no idea what he meant. But exactly four years later, I was transferred out to Los Angeles. And when I went up to San Francisco for a visit and saw a white tower, I thought, oh, 
you know, Bob appointed down there as where he wanted me to be. And uh, that was 50, 56 to 1960. So I always felt Bob, and it was a whirlwind way that I got to LA. It was just an irresistible yank, you know, from one side of the country to the other. And Mattel hired me, and many times my job was shaky. And uh, I said, no, Baba put me here. He certainly wants me here. But I stayed there at Mattel 13 years, and I'm still there in California. So it was like being a pawn, you know, plucked up, bang, you know, because there was really no Baba activity in L.A. It was like sort of a barren land at that point. At the start, the Baba worked there. And we had a wonderful time with Baba in San Francisco. We had a lot of private meetings and different things happened. And one day he called all of us in and said, I'm arranging for an East-West gathering, which has never happened. He never called for that. Um, I think the first date was supposed to be in December 56. Anyway, he turned around to the whole room and he said, you must come and you must come and you must come. And you must try very hard to come, and you should try very hard to come. So we started calling ourselves the must, you see. I was like, you must. Come. Well, it, it, it was changed the date several times, and finally it turned out to be 1962 that we had the East-West Gathering. Uh, but those people that Bob had pointed to and said, you must try very hard to come, they either didn't make it, or they'd left Baba, or they had a terrible time getting to India. So it was like, you know. Baba pointed out to them. <laughs> uh, of course, we didn't know that at the time. And uh, Baba gave us all was little individual lessons, and you know how if the, the one thing people say, "How do you know Baba's God?" I think that one very easy way to see that he's God is that he's not giving. You know, he'd give us little discourses, but his main work was on us as a bunch of people. And here we are. Uh, 80 people traveling with Baba, and then uh, I don't know how many Sufis and other people in San Francisco, working on their karma all together, and creating all these little, little internecine scenes and actions and things to teach you a particular lesson. And he's keeping the whole thing rolling without any effort at all. <laughs> he uses all your little karmas, and uh, like there was one woman who was traveling with us. Was just that sort of person nobody likes, you know, just sort of a pest. And we're all trying to avoid her. <laughs> no, we come in one morning, and there she is. Baba's got her very specially close to him, and she's rubbing his feet, and, you know, she's getting all the separate, special attention. From him. So you kind of go, ooh, <laughs> a little lessons like that. And, uh, um, you know, Baba was very good to me always up to that point. I really hadn't had one of these. I had really a great deal of help from Elizabeth and Narina, Margaret and all in those years before I actually met Baba to hear uh, how, you know, how you are with Baba and what you do or don't do and all that. And so I was more lucky than others who really didn't know how to behave, let's say. <laughs> I remember one woman, I'm skipping around here, but while we were waiting often to be called to Baba's room in the hotel, this one woman um, said, oh, why well, here so-and-so, Lud Dimple, is very ill with pneumonia. What kind of a master is Bobby doesn't heal him? And uh, I said, no, would never say such a thing about Bob. And the truth was that on the very first day, or I think it was the first night, they had arranged for Baba to go to the cow palace and see the ice show. It was very, very cold, too, in July there. It was freezing. When we stepped out of the airport, Baba was shivering. We were all, the, the Sufis were there with their fur coats on. <laughs> that was July. July? July. It's, a, it's the winter in California. The <coughs> cold comes from the Arctic. So uh, they took Baba to the ice show, and it was freezing in that cow palace. And the show was it was just a nice show, and on the ice come costumed devils, you know, running around like devils. And at that moment, Baba got up and left. <laughs> it was sort of funny. And he, was, he had a coat on, he had a hat on. Well, this story I heard later, uh, Ludd had driven him there, and hit the, you know how they have these park valets, and the valet had parked his car some god-awful place, so he was waiting there 
for hours, it seems like, with Baba, for his car. And he was shivering, uh, Baba was shivering, and he was shivering. Baba put his hand on Lutz's forehead, and it turned out, Baba said, you know, let's get the doctor right away. He had double pneumonia, double pneumonia. And the doctor had said it would take weeks for him to get well. And Baba said, three days. And uh, he told Marisha, I don't know whether he ever told Lud, he said, Lud was supposed to die at this time, but I've given him the pneumonia, and he won't die. He has too much work for me to do, to do for me. And so he did. He had pneumonia and got well in three days. But you see he had overworked, and he was cold and hot and everything. So when I, this woman, you know, saying, why doesn't Baba heal? Now, what did, you just don't know anything about how masters work, <laughs> the stupidity of it all. And um, little incidents. So where was I? Oh. Anyway, Baba was very good to me. And all through the trip of 56, uh, Baba had had a savas previous in India to this one, and messages had been dictated by him, and they were all typed in a notebook. And at various times along the way, uh, they were read out. It was mostly Don Stevens, who has a nice voice, who read the messages. And I was taking in shorthand everything else that happened. I was writing up the whole trip, and Ivy and I had kind of divided up the job of, she had people taping, and she had Charmin taking the movie, which you saw, and I was taking shorthand and notes and stuff. And uh, so I assumed, you know, that these messages would be mine for the awakener because Baba would, the message would be read and then Baba would go on and explain more and, uh, you know, questions were asked and everything, so it all flowed together. So there at the hotel in San Francisco, I see Billy Eaton running around with a lot of manuscripts. And I said, Billy, what are you doing? Oh, I'm typing. What are you typing? Oh, uh, the messages. Baba's given them to Ivy for a book. These messages I thought would go in the awake here, you know, chunk, <laughs> my heart fell over. But I didn't say anything, of course. And um, the next morning, Baba, or pretty, I don't know, very soon after that, Baba called for everybody on the awakener to come in. We had a, a, a board meeting with Baba. <laughs> and it, uh, he asked how we were doing. We, we only had $40 in the treasury. And Baba said, What do you, went around the room. This is the wonderful thing about Baba. He never says, You should. So. He always asked everybody's opinion, said, what do you think should be done to keep the awakener going? And someone said, oh, it should have travel articles and blah, blah, blah. And then the last thing, he turned to me and said, what do you think, Phyllis? I said, I started it for you, Baba, and it should just be about you. If it isn't, then what's the point of it all? And Baba said, and I will help you. And it took me months to figure out that Baba knew I felt disturbed about these messages. And that to show, you know, to balance it, he, you know, gave the attention to the awakener and everything. You know, stupid me, I didn't get it right away, but I do now. <laughs> and in 58, again, uh, messages like that were brought. And at the end of the trip here in 58, Baba handed me that book of messages. And uh, those were printed in the awake and later in the path of them. But if any of you want to follow the messages of life at its best, then follow with the uh, issues of the awakener, what was said about them on that trip uh, when I wrote up. So they kind of match, you know, someday somewhere they'll match up together. But uh, that was sort of a, you know, Bob always pokes you where your little ego is, <laughs> has to get you. And mine is in printing and uh, manuscripts and stuff like that. Part of it, God knows where the rest of it is. But. <laughs> anyway, I thought those are a few stories. We went through Muir Woods with Baba, these beautiful old trees, and they had a section uh, where, you know, at the year 1000, the ring, and 2000, you know, all that, and there's a little mark there that this was uh, the year 1 AD that, that, you know, Jesus was born in or something. And I remember Bob, I was just right behind Bob, and he, he looked, you know, he stopped and looked at this big thing. It was sort of interesting that he really was interested in it. And he also put his hand on one tree, one of these tremendous 2,000-year-old sequoias. And I just had that flash, you know, that tree's had it. It's going to drop its tree body now after 2,000 years. 
and go on in evolution. You know, you have these kind of little flashes with God. And, uh, oh, well, a few other little Baba tales. Um, in 62, Darshan, just to show how Baba's mind is so universal, sitting in the 62 Darshan, there were 10,000 people, right? All Baba lovers, not just Savasis, uh, I mean, just people coming for Darshan. I was the only one in that audience that knew the address of one person, uh, Jim Bryan. <clears throat> Baba sent, I think it was Ann Conlon, he sent Ann Conlon to contact me to get the address because this man hadn't come to the darshan. And uh, later, Baba sent him a lovely cable. He said, your love is here with me like my love is there with you. Mm -hmm. There were many people who weren't able to make these trips. And Baba always said, you know, you, you will gain even though you weren't able to make the trip. And I think of that, you gain as much as the others. But he, he knew, in fact, in, in the 62, he said, don't come if you endanger your health or your job or something. And that was kind of hard for some people to decide <laughs> whether their health or their job was a thing. And he also said, don't borrow from each other. And uh, some people did that, and they got into a lot of trouble. <laughs> it's like you disobey Bob. Also, he had told us, uh, we left for the 62 Darshan in October, just at the peak of the missile crisis. And when we arrived the first morning, uh, this was when Bob already had the hip injury and he didn't look very good and he said, how do I look? And we said, Baba, you look wonderful. That's always the right answer. Remember that when Baba comes. You don't tell him he looks pale or sick. He said, Baba, you look wonderful. And uh, he said, but, in, he went like this, inside I'm like a volcano. He said, the world was on the brink of the Third World War and I put a stop to it. And uh, if you remember the missile crisis, even Kennedy didn't know why the Russians backed off. <laughs> so suddenly, it's like the Suez Crisis. Anthony Eden was all ready to toss the bomb, you know, and he suddenly stopped. And uh, it's Bob, you know. And we have to think. I think of that with even the Iran crisis when President Carter and all those helicopters and stuff. You know, the biggest government in the world can't get five helicopters down on the ground. You know, obviously somebody <laughs> chucking a dust storm. <laughs> Yeah, it was very obvious, I <laughs> think. Like Mohammed throwing a handful of dust at his enemies. That dust got the helicopter. So we were often with Bob again at the peak of a world crisis. But he had told us to go directly to him and go directly home. And this one unnamed lady got up and said, Well, Bob, I'm very old. I'd like to go see the Taj Mahal and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Bob says, The Taj Mahal is here. <laughs> no, Baba, I can't. Okay, go. So, they, three or four of them went up there and uh, they saw the Taj Mahal by moonlight. It was very beautiful. And then they go back to New Delhi and one gets very sick and then uh, they got so much trouble and sickness and terrible things happening all the way along. You see, they had not taken... People did that very often. Well, Ask Baba a question, what they should do. And then Baba says, don't or do. And then they start arguing with Baba. And then Baba says, all right, do what you want. And that's where you're in trouble. <laughs> and people even turn around and say, Baba told me to do it. Anyway, those little little hints. Well, now I don't have much more time, do I? But I have, uh, I read this at the Savas we had recently in the, Los Angeles, four-day service in the mountains. And we're going to have one next year. You're all invited. Uh, this was 25 ways to remember Mayor Obama. Do you mind if I read something? Um, I can't read with my glasses. <laughs> I start out by saying, take his name 25 times every day. So that's it. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> shout his name, murmur his name, write his name, take his name every time you sneeze. Kachu, Baba. Take it once a day like medicine. 
Remember Kaikobad said it 100,000 times a day and began to experience Baba's divine light. Give something away every day, even if it's only a smile. The more you give away, the less Baba has to take away. Call Baba up on the phone and say hello. Tell him how you feel. Dial L-U-V-B-A-B. <laughs> Choose a new Baba sentence each day for medication. Paste it on your bathroom min mirror or on your refrigerator. When you go for a snack, you get Baba whacked. God has a sense of humor, why don't you? <laughs> In this universe, the joke's on you. Ha ha. You better enjoy it. Don't be bored with his universe. After all, he made it. And so many people say, I'm bored. I say, how can you be bored? This is God's world. Do your yoga every day. You go. When troubled or worried, Visualize being in the tomb and laying your head on the tomb. Um. Tell a joke to Baba. Baba often asks us to tell a joke. You've heard that many times. And I was terrible at that. I couldn't think of that. <laughs> Ivy was good. She had a little reader's digest on her seat. <laughs> <laughs> Wit is it. Wit is in. And a little boy at the Savas, Rylander, told his mommy not to worry about Baba's picture falling, falling down all the time. He said, every time it falls, I remember Baba. <laughs> the little child, the little four-year-old. See every failure, yours and others, as a forward step in learning. Step to it. Put worry out every night with a cat. <laughs> See evil as a lesser good. Baba said, saints are my assets and sinners my liabilities. So make friends with some other liabilities. <laughs> Be cheerful even if it hurts. Baba said it helps others. It's the old cliche that rainbows are made of sun and rain. Remember your true friend is Baba, and everyone is your friend. Dissolve fear by loving and daring. Kick the worry habit. It costs too much and you can't take it off your income tax. <laughs> Write a letter to Baba and mail it. Mail it in a copy of God Speaks. Or better yet, read God Speaks ten times like Baba said. He told us in 62, read God Speaks ten times. Anybody here read Baba? God Speaks ten times. Was that, was that a specific group for specific people, or was that uh, general? Variable? He said it to 10,000 people. <laughs> <laughs> I think every kind of person. The one kind of <laughs> he also said, uh, you know, uh, it was so cute. Uh, uh, they had the Four Journeys chart brought out in 1962, and Francis read the explanation. Of it. A very solemn, you know, the inner journey in space. And, and Baba looked around at all of us and said, do you understand? He said, I don't understand it. <laughs> and then he said, God speaks us for the future, the intellectuals, and all that matters for you is love. So, he, you know, it's a paradox. He says, read it ten times and then it doesn't matter, you just need to love him. You know. <laughs> Remember all the words you ever say, collect in one place. So say them well, and you won't be deafened. You know, Baba did say that. Adi told us that. Baba said, all the things you've said become like, it's like the law of sense here. They pile up, and you see, so you can either have noise or music, depending on what you said. Nice things, good things, bad things. Love yourself. You're Baba's closest.